together and we're going to also pues estaremos edificándonos we have a lot of knowledge to kick off this webinar series that the uh, Dominican uh, parade is has the national Dominican parade has for everybody and of course it is my uh, duty to and also my privilege to introduce uh, one of the uh, responsible for this event. Uh, I want to also welcome the hundreds of participants that right now uh, in your different uh, locations are joining in and also their donations that are, uh, of course, helping $1 to $1,000 uh, helping uh, going towards this scholarship. Our annual partners also, our sponsors, our supporters, and in particular, our scholarship recipients. We do this event and all the events that we do with, with for you. But before we start officially, of course, we have to, uh, before we start a workshop, we have to call and introduce one of the main members is responsible for this evening and all the events that we uh, do and we do around here. Let me call the president of the organization, Wilton Cedeño. Wilton is a distinguished uh, energy executive over the 30 years uh, in the industry. He has been featured both in Fortune Magazine and Wall Street Journal. His passion has always been developing the next generation of leaders and equipping them with the skills for real success. Ha sido un fundador, miembro fundador de la Asociación Americana de Latinos in STEM, member, of course, uh, a founding member of the American Association of Latinos in STEM, and currently serves as the chair, ahora mismo es el presidente de la uh, board de directores del National Dominican Day Parade Incorporated. Con ustedes, el presidente. Wilton Cedeño. Gracias, Rafael. And we are honored that you are with us. I mean, you always take time for the National Dominican Day Parade. So from the bottom of our heart, and on behalf of the National uh, of, of Directors, we would like to thank you for all that you do for the Dominican uh, community. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart. And uh, today, I mean- It is my privilege. Thank you, Rafael. And, and today it's an honor to really have these workshops uh, for students, uh, for professionals. I know uh, my nephew and my niece uh, are, are watching, so uh, welcome. But let me just tell you a little bit about um, our presenter today. I, I took his course when I was in our corporate America and I was responsible for the biggest electric system in the, in the country, in New York City. And I use these techniques that you're gonna to learn tonight. I use them and they propelled me to be the first Dominican in charge of the electrical system for New York City. So if you use the techniques, they will give you results. Again, if you don't use them like anything, else, they would not give you results. So please pay attention. Uh, he's an expert in his field. This is all he's done for the last 50 years is to train people on how to uh, uh, increase their memory capacity. So again, congratulations, you're in for a treat. Uh, be before I leave uh, the stage, I again, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, uh, the Board of Directors of the Na National Dominican Day Parade for all their efforts and for sponsoring, helping us to sponsor this, uh, this event. This event also is uh, being uh, sponsored in, by our next uh, speaker, and that's uh, Idanis Rodriguez. If you heard his name, he is one of the most distinguished representatives of the Dominican Latino community and all New Yorkers around the country. He's a health advocate. He's an education advocate. I mean, he fought for uh, uh, keeping tuitions low in, uh, in, in City College uh, for students. Uh, he's fighting right now for a new set of laws that will help immigrants uh, vote in New York City. But today we have asked them to really speak about this solemn day today, flight, American Airlines flight 587 and what happened. So we know that our young students will never forget this date. I know I saw you earlier at the ceremony, uh, Councilman, uh, please welcome uh, to our first uh, webinar series on brain power and optimizing the brain power, but dedicated to the memories of those valiant, uh, of those courageous Dominicans. Thank you. Idalis Rodriguez.
Y, y Danes, eh, queremos ir, eh, hable un poco ahora. Sí, al parecer estamos teniendo algunas, algunos problemas técnicos con Idanis. Eh, estamos viendo en la transmisión también, eh, presidente. Me parecería que podríamos entonces eh, conversar con nuestros productores para que pasemos de media. Ahí está el concejal Idanis Rodríguez. ¿Nos escucha, Idanis? Estoy viendo los monitores para tratar de ver si tiene audio. Eh, Idanis estuvo en la ceremonia. He was just in the ceremony, as uh, uh, the president stated. Of course, today is a sad day, but also it's a, it's a date that uh, gives pride to the Dominican community and the Hispanic community in New York City. Al parecer perdimos la señal de Idanis, el concejal Idanis Rodríguez. Uh, Rafael, uh, let's uh, move forward with, with the program. No problem. Uh, we, we're getting a, a static uh, with Councilman's connection. Uh, but uh, but definitely what he would like to say and is pay homage uh, to the crew at five, uh, 587, uh, there were uh, 260 passengers uh, that lost their lives uh, back in November 12 of 2001. And um, we, we remember uh, those Dominicans on the flight. Uh, we had 68 Dominicans. We remember all the passengers on that flight. And we send our, our peace and our love uh, to their families. Uh, there were 260 passengers and five people uh, on the ground uh, that, yeah. that, that passed away. In those days, uh, it was thought to be something related to 9-11. Uh, But on, on further investigation, it was a mechanical problem that Flight 587 had to the, to the Dominican Republic. Uh, the, uh, the plane aircraft exploded in Queens, and there every year uh, they, they celebrate the memory of all those passengers. And that uh, occurred today, this morning, and present again was Councilman Idanis Rodriguez, our Congressman Adiano Spallat, our Assemblywoman Carmen de la Rosa, and our Mayor Bill de Blasio, along with the family members of, of those that passed away. So, so we, so we, uh, so we just wanted to uh, have a moment with them. And that way, Mr. President, thank you for your words. Uh, we honor and we send our prayers uh, on our hearts are, are of course, uh, satin, but also we send our sympathies to the families. I myself uh, knew some families that lost their loved ones in that flight. But let's, what do you think if we switch gears and start with a program for tonight? Of course, we will try to, to reach or to make contact again with Councilman Idanis Rodriguez, maybe uh, later during the night. But we want you to know what type of uh, workshop we have for tonight. We will have our trainer doing interactive uh, sessions and people, you guys can ask questions either on Facebook. We, this is uh, going live on Facebook as well, on YouTube. And if you have time, if we have time at the end, we'll try to respond to those uh, questions. In this uh, interactive session, we are going to talk about the importance of memory, remembering, uh, reminding things. Memory is uh, our ability to encode, to store, and to retain, uh, and then recall information uh, in our in past experiences. Uh, la memoria is fundamental. The memory is fundamental in our life and professional uh, and personal lives, reflecting the past and, of course, as the past, that offering uh, the possibility of reaching the all past and present experiences, as well as helping to ensure continuity between uh, what we want what we what was going to be and we will be. Also researchers from the National Institute of Health and Aging have found that adults who went through short bursts of memory training were better able to maintain higher cognitive functioning and in everyday skills. O sea que es algo muy importante porque no solamente los jóvenes, eh, ustedes que son muchos jóvenes, sino también los adultos mayores, pues podrían tener grandes beneficios utilizar las técnicas que estaremos pues hablando 
esta noche. Por supuesto, uh, ahora vamos a presentarles. Now we're going to introduce our speaker of the night. Uh, he was president of memory. He is the president of memory training systems for 30 years. Uh, author of Business of Memory, published in Random House, uh, Rodel founder and director of the Memory Training Institute in Geneva and Switzerland. Over 200 major corporations, associations, universities, hospitals, and individuals' clients in 25 countries. Senior coach contributed to and appeared on two films productions of memory for Scientific American Frontiers with Alan Alda. Guest appearance on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox and Friends. Of course, uh, we are going to introduce uh, a person that is going to give us one of the best tools we can ever, ever have. Please put your hands for Frank Feberban. He has the stage. Hello, Raphael. Hello, Frank. Okay, I think I'm blocked on the screen by the private chat. <laughs> is that so? I see, I see you in the- You see me? Oh, yes, okay. I see you. Oh, Looking okay. handsome as always. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm I'm really delighted to be here to share some of my uh, expertise, some of my thoughts, my ideas, and strategies, and even techniques uh, with all the students who are participating in this program. And to begin with, I thought we'd try a little experiment. Uh, I'd like everybody to put their hands on their head, okay? Just hold your head. Now, what you are holding is the most amazing, the most powerful biocomputer in the universe. And there is nothing that compares with the human brain. And what I'd like to do is step inside the human brain and give you an idea of the power of this amazing biocomputer. First of all, when you were born, you were given as a gift 100 billion brain cells, 100 billion brain cells to start with. That's a nice foundation. Each one of those brain cells can connect with another brain cell. And over your lifetime, even now while you're in school, you probably have connected and you're probably up to a trillion brain cells. Uh, in terms of connections. Every time you learn something new, you make a new connection. That strengthens your brain, it makes your brain have cognitive reserve, and you're able to learn and think uh, and react more effectively as a result. Now, this amazing biocomputer actually is very convenient. It has no plugs, no switches, no battery, it has a hard case which you never have to open up. It works 24 hours a day, it's a very hard worker, and, and you never have to repair it unless you have brain surgery. So here you have the most powerful biocomputer and it's right between your ears. We all own one and we have to take care of it. We can't take it for granted. If we take it for granted, then we lose that ability, okay? So, uh, let's also look at something that's very interesting. Uh, with all this beck and power at your call, the average person uses only one to 2% of their conscious brain power, the intellectual brain power, one to 2%. Now, that's not a lot especially when you consider that the, the, if you did three, four, five, six percent, you would do amazing things. I have coached and trained mental athletes for the USA Memory Championship, and these were ordinary people who just went for the training. They trained, they went into competition, and they won medals, and they won trips to Europe, and, and they, they came in first, second, third, and they did extraordinary things as a result of training their memory. So you must believe that your brain can do more than one to 2%. Okay, now, five years from now, you will all be the same person, except 
for the books you read, the people you meet, the places you go, the risks that you take, and the skills that you develop. And one of the most important skills of all is the skill of remembering. Now, you notice I said remembering because memory is a verb, not a noun. It's something you have to do. It's a conscious act on your part. It's not something that happens to you. So as a result, you need to uh, actually do something to make your memory work, okay? Now, this skill of memory is just like thinking and listening and talking and, and writing and even dancing and singing, except for one thing. Everything that you do is based on memory. And if you look at that chart that's up on the screen now, that's called the memory wheel. The memory is in the middle. Memory is a meta skill, which means that it affects everything that it touches. If you improve your memory, all those skills improve simultaneously. Time management, communication, problem solving, decision making, giving presentations, training other people, even negotiating a contract, even going for an interview for a job once you graduate from school. All that is based on your memory. If if your memory is working at optimal, all those skills improve and the whole board lights up. Okay? So memory has a dramatic effect on everything we do. All right. Now, just to give you a little uh, a personal thing, it's interesting that my birthday, which I'm not going to tell you, happened to come out when I was born. And the top song that year or that time was Will I Remember? So I guess I was destined to be in the memory field. Okay. A little information for you. All right. Uh, now, if we improve our memory, we can tap into the brain and we can go from average to awesome because brain power is something that is constantly increasing if you work at it. Actually, somebody told me something years ago. He asked me, what is the largest room in the world? I didn't know the answer at the time, but I'd like to share it with you. The largest room in the world is the room for improvement. There's no limitation on how much you can improve, whether you're getting grades in school or anything connected to your memory. All right. Now, like a diamond, there are many facets to your memory and to your brain. And we're going to go into those facets and how you can improve them. We want to master the most powerful skill of all. Now, there are four zones of information. This, this is the target of your brain. We are bombarded by lots of information every day, whether you're in school or in your career. There are four major zones or domains of information. The first one is people information. People information is names and faces of anybody you will meet, plus information connected to those people. So you create a people cluster. So if you remember a name and a face, you can connect any information to that cluster about that person. Second, spoken information, exactly what I'm doing now. Everything that's spoken is very fragile. Your conversations with your uh, classmates, your conversations with your professors, your conversations over the phone, your conversations on, Spike, on Skype and on Zoom. These are all spoken words and if you don't do anything with the information that's presented to you, it disappears. It goes up in smoke. A third zone of information is numerical. We live in a world where everything is numbers. Think about it. Your passwords, your college ID, 
your social security, your bank account numbers, your ATM numbers, your address, your phone number, uh, textbooks, numbers for this, numbers for that. It just goes on and on. You are dependent on knowing those numbers because they all have an impact on your life. So numbers are the third zone. Fourth zone is written information. All the textbooks, the articles, the reports, everything you're dealing with in school, all your notes that you take in all the lecture halls. You, most, most notes that most students take, two days later they can't quite figure out what they wrote based on their handwriting, unless they're using the computer or laptop to take the notes. But usually, if you concentrate on taking the notes, you're not listening to the lecture. So you're doing two things at once. Very difficult. Uh, so those are the four zones of information. Now, in order to conquer, to master those four zones, you already own four powers in your mind. Four powers. Observation concentration, visualization, and association. Let's talk about each. Observation, the ability to look and see. Your, your brain, your eyes, your senses take in huge gulps of information. And your brain has the ability to filter out about 99.8% of that information. It, it, thank goodness that's, that's the case because you wouldn't be able to handle it. And Observation gives you the ability to see differences in things. What's larger, what's smaller, what's, what's uh, uh, prettier, what's handsomer, what's uh, different, what's the same. Similarities and differences. That's what observation allows you to do. In fact, there's a, there's a little story, that I, a parable, uh, that illustrates this. And it goes like this. A little girl is walking down Park Avenue with her little chihuahua. And a little boy comes by and he looks down at the dog and he says, what use is a dog like that? And the little girl responds, he protects me from lions. And the little boy says, do you expect me to believe that? And the little girl responds, do you see any lions around here? So <laughs> that's a little illustration of observation. Only sometimes you see it in your mind and sometimes you see it in the real world. So observation is the first step to paying attention, okay? The next power that you have is the power of concentration. Concentration is the threshold to memory. If you can't concentrate, you can't remember because information won't penetrate your brain since you're not concentrating on the information. We are living in a world of distractions. There's telephone calls, there's uh, noise from construction, there's people coming into our room, into our, uh, in, into our house and having conversations with us. It's, it's a constant influx of distractions. But the biggest distraction of all is the chatter in your mind, the conversations that are going on inside your head. Every day you're thinking about this. What about that report that was due on Wednesday and it's Thursday? What about the test I'm taking on Tuesday and I haven't studied yet? What about my dental appointment? And so on and so on. And every day you're thinking about these things and you're having little conversations in your head. That is your prime distraction. And what happens when you lose concentration, it's a very interesting event that occurs. Your eyes and your mind separate. When they work together as a team, you're able to concentrate and focus like a laser beam and be in that concentration zone. But when you're distracted by all the things I mentioned, the eyes and mind separate. A good example of that is driving a car. And that happens to me also. You're driving, you're holding the steering wheel, you're looking ahead at all the traffic in front of you, and you're thinking about something else. So your mind has gone there and you're looking straight ahead. 
It's a good thing it doesn't last long because it's not very safe. So that's a, an example of what we call a fugue state, F-U-G-U-E, in which your mind and your eyes separate. Now, in order to get your eyes and mind to work together, there are various exercises that you can do. One of those exercises that I developed, and I got it from Tibetan Buddhist monks. I did research on this about 20 years ago. And I found out that there is something called the magic mandala. That on the screen is a magic mandala. It's a design which originated in India, and it's used in architecture and art. And Tibetan monks use it for meditation. They can meditate for hours and hours on end. But I took it, and I, and I found out it could be used for concentration. And you'll notice that there is a central nucleus area, circle in the middle. Every mandala has that central focus. And you can get copies of different mandalas. You can go online, look up the word M-A-N-D-A-L-A, -A -A, and you can Google thousands of them. And you could probably print them out for use for the exercise I'm going to show you. Okay, now, what I'd like you to do as a, as a little get-to-know-you kind of thing in terms of what a Mandela could do, I'd like you all, when I say go, to focus in on the central area of that Mandela. And while you're doing it, I want you to take a deep breath and breathe in and out, but take in a deeper breath because the more breath you take in, the more oxygen goes to the brain, and that is food for the brain cells. So, are you ready? Well, I'm going to give you one minute. Ready? Begin. Focus on the central area of that Mandela and think of nothing else. Concentrate. Focus. Concentrate. 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 Focus on the central area. Keep your mind blank. Focus. Concentrate. Focus. Concentrate. Okay. Now, I don't know how you felt. You can't tell me, but, or you can tell me by writing in. Uh, you're probably more relaxed and less stressed out. Now, this is the exercise. I do this every morning and I do this every afternoon. I've been doing it 20 years. All my clients, which number close to 200,000 in 25 countries, about 65, 75%, they all have a Mandela sitting on their desk at their office, in their, in their business, in their, uh, Whatever career they're in, they have one available to look at in case their eyes and mind separate. Because stress does that to you. It'll separate you. Now, take a look at that. You see that Albert Einstein said, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Now, I'm not saying you're all idiots, but that's what could happen because we have outsourced our brain to technology. And if we're actually depending on a, on a smartphone, on a computer, on any other technology for the powers that we usually have in our brain, what eventually will happen is that the brain will get smaller and smaller until we all look like Martians. Uh, and that is not what we want to have happen. So, we want you to, to stop using technology the way you did. And also, we want you to stop multitasking. Multitasking is not <laughs> good for your brain. I think Raphael wanted to ask me that question. Oh, uh, yeah. I have a question now because I know that you are just disrupting what we have in mind, what our viewers 
perhaps are thinking, Frank, because there are three very important things. Uh, the what we felt with the Mandela, I, I it started like blurring itself, and then I just saw uh, the circles. What kind right. of effect uh, does that? Uh, well, does the Mandela if you, give if us? If you do that, if you do that two minutes in the morning and two minutes in the afternoon. You choose the time and you do this for seven weeks. All right. So that's four minutes a day invested in your brain. If you do that in seven weeks, your concentration span will increase 20 to 35%. What does that mean for you? That means you will be able to do more work in less time. If you had three hours of work, you'll probably be able to do it in an hour and a half. And then you save an hour and a half to use for other tasks and activities. This is, this works. I've done but, this. But why, I, and I know there are people, Frank, uh, asking themselves, why looking at that little square right. uh, and maybe the rest of it is like blurry in our mind, but why focusing like a laser beam uh, gives us that concentration in seven weeks. What is our brain doing when we do that? Okay, well, it gets all your senses, in this case, mainly your eyes, which is your dominant sense, focusing on one source rather than being distracted by many things. It also centers your attention. The brain loves the center. It loves to look at things in the center of things rather than to the right or left or top or bottom. So you're doing something that's natural to the brain. It also quiets the chattering in your mind. So if you're having all those conversations in your head, which is a major distraction, it, it quiets them and it sort of puts them in the background. And best of all, it reconnects your mind with your eyes your eyes with your mind. When that happens, then it acts as a team. And when it acts as a team, you get into the concentration zone. And when you're in that zone, nothing could stop you. You can do lots of work in less time and you'll have more energy when you finish. You'll be able to do more things because there's less of a fatigue, there's less of a worrying that you didn't finish what you did before. So this will work seven weeks, four minutes a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. And that's four minutes invested. I don't think that would take much time out of anybody's day. It works. <laughs> I'll shoot you an email because I need it. That was my second question. How do I reconnect my mind and my eyes? Because I, I don't know if I was a DDHD or whatever, one of those syndromes when I was little, because I yeah. tend to disconnect. But my third part is, what well, you just mentioned, walking and chewing gum is not nice then. Multitasking, what we try to do today, have a cell phone, uh, take a phone call from work or doing something on the computer, right. working on many tasks at the same time, that is not necessarily beneficial. Multitasking is, is dangerous, okay? I, wa I want to frighten people about it. Multitasking, we are, the human brain is a monotasker not a multitasker. When you multitask, you are doing, let's say two, three, four things at one time. And instead of putting 100% of your brain power on one task, you're spreading it out. You're doing 10% here, 20% here, 15 there and 10 there. So what happens? You start on one task, and you, and you figure, well, I'm not interested in this. I'm going to go to the next one. So you go to the next one, and the first one starts bothering you because you know you didn't finish it. So you're on to the third and the fourth, and by the time you're finished, you haven't done anything. Basically, because you have to do one thing at a time. If you have, it, you have five tasks, do the first one, get it done. Second, get it done. Third, get it done. All the way to the end. You will be much happier. Even if you think that you're happy of multitasking, it's not a multitasking doesn't show that you are strong or that your brain has the ability to diversify. It doesn't work and you have to calm down. Now, once in a while in your life, you can multitask. Like for instance, when my son was born, 
<laughs> I had to drive my wife to the hospital and I went the wrong way. Okay. And I was living <laughs> on the island. I was living on the island of Bermuda and it's not that big. And I went the wrong way. So I had to think, I had to get back now. I had to get to the hospital. I had to call this person. I had to find out from the doctor. So I was doing four things at once because of this major event in my life and my wife's life. And it worked out fine. Uh, and uh, that's where multitasking can play a role. If you are a surgeon and you're in the hospital and you're operating on somebody, you have the help of nurses uh, and other doctors to help you, but you, you do multitask. You're doing this, then you're doing that. You're sewing this up. You're taking that out. So multitasking has its place, but it should not be a regular thing that you do in your life. It should be once in a while. Because if you do it all the time, you're going to diminish the power of your brain. So I hope I scared enough of the students. <laughs> watching. Yo, millennials, don't go away. This is going to continue because they're going to hate you now. Go on. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so basically, we, we've talked about concentration. Concentration, very important. And, and the Mandela allows you to do that. So I, I, I plead with you, use the Mandela for the next seven weeks. Now, the third power is the power of visualization. What is visualization? The ability to see things in your, in your mind. Uh, the, the brain, the eyes, the channels from the eyes, the neur neuronal channels or the nerve cells in the eyes to the brain are 25 times larger than all the other senses, okay? So the brain is dominant. The, bra the brain itself operates about 65% on visual. So why not make use of that power? Also, visualization is a big part of your life. We love pictures. We were brought up on movies and TV. We were brought up on on uh, going to a show. We were brought up on seeing people, on going to a rock concert, on seeing events occur. We're visualizing and we see them in our mind's eye. We also see things in our, our mind's eye that happened in the past because memory is a time traveler. It goes from the past to the present to the future. And you can go back and forth. You can sit in your chair like I'm sitting in my chair now or you're sitting in your chair and you could travel anywhere in the world just thinking about it. Think how amazing that is. You could visualize yourself sitting under a palm tree in the Dominican Republic or in Bermuda or you could be in Paris by the Eiffel Tower. Uh, but wear your mask. <laughs> and basically the the memory is actually more about the future than it is about the past because everything you've done and everything you're doing now will be in your future and remember as yogi berra used to say the future is not what it used to be changes have occurred so you have to adapt to it and by having this skill you are equipping yourself to deal with any situation. Now, visualization, let me give you an example of a visualization. If I said to you that an acre of land, an acre of land is equal to 4,045 square meters. That's not very interesting, is it? It's abstract numbers. It's, it's data. It's nothing that you want to really get involved with. However, if I told you and this is a fact, that one acre of land is equal to a football field. A football field. You know what a football field looks like? You have to just went up into your mind's eye and you see the football field. That is what an acre of land looks like. So you created a concrete image of what an acre is just by visualizing. Okay? Now, you also visualize many actually there was a study done uh which in which 
they used a uh, a basketball game as the as the uh, event. They took three groups, A, B, and C, and they uh, created a benchmark. Each one of the groups stood before the foul line and threw a basketball into the basket. And they did this until over a period of time, and they decided what they are capable of doing in a normal way for A, B, and C. Then they instructed A that they had to practice three hours a day for 20 days in front of the basket, throwing from the foul line. Group B didn't have to do anything. They could go on a vacation. Group C could sit in their chair like we're doing now and visualize throwing a basketball in the basket for three hours a day for 20 days, okay? At the end of the 20 days, they measured the results. Of course, group B, who didn't do anything, didn't improve at all. Group A, who threw the basket, who threw basketballs in the basket physically, improved 23%. Group C, who visualized doing all that, improved, wait till you hear this number, improved 22%. They improved 1% less than the group that actually threw the basket, the basketball in the basket continually for three hours a day for 20 days. So you can see how powerful your visualization powers are. You can visualize anything. I know concert pianists who do the same thing. They can visualize themselves playing a concerto uh, with, a, with a symphony orchestra in their mind. So when they get up on stage, they are that much better doing it. And this could apply to many, many different things. Baseball, football, learning in school. It, it's amazing. Now, the human brain, as you see on the screen, is essentially a pattern making and pattern using system. That means whenever you remember something, you're creating a pattern in your brain. For everything you remember, when those two neurons get together, a pattern is created between them. And that's your memory, okay? So there's a visual. In fact, this ability of the human brain is what artificial intelligence is based on. Artificial intelligence experts started modeling the brain, the human brain, to come up with their artificial intelligence. So you can see how powerful your brain is if they created artificial intelligence based on what your model is and my model is. So it's very precious. Take good care of it. Okay, now, the final power that you want to elevate, because that's what you want to do. You want to raise these powers to another level so they all are able to conquer those information target zones. Association is when you connect one thing with another and one brings back the other. Actually, you're connecting the new, new information with the known, which is information you already have in your memory. So the more information you know, the easier it is to learn new information. And you connect the new with the known. That's what association is, connecting information. Now, one of the major ways of connecting information is telling a story. A story is a wonderful way of presenting and receiving information, uh, basically because storytelling actually allows you to build a memory structure and you could attach things to it. And normally, if you in your life have a great event, let's say you get a straight A on an exam, you pass all your courses, you do well, you're accepted into graduate school, whatever's happening, you go on a great vacation, uh, you watch a wonderful movie, you get married, all those things are great. What are you compelled to do when you get back? You're compelled to talk about it. And the way you talk about it is telling a story. And on that note, I want to share a story with you now. 
This is a true story, family story. And uh, I, want, I want you to see how powerful storytelling is. My brother, his name is Harvey, okay? And he lives in Rome, Italy, okay? He's been there for many years. And we call each other maybe once a week, once every two weeks. So when I was writing my book, The Business of Memory, this was back actually in 2004, I called him and I said, Harvey, what are you doing? And he says, believe it or not, I'm watching a baseball game. I said, really? I didn't know they showed baseball in Europe because usually it's soccer. He said, they started doing it recently and I'm watching the Yankees play the Red Sox at Yankee Stadium. And he says, you know, as I'm watching this, my mind, my memory started to sail back in time to when I was a teenager, when I was 15, 16 years old, back in 1947. I was with my friends. This is my brother speaking now. I was with my friends, Lenny, Georgie, uh, jo Lenny, Georgie, Bert, Franco, and Anthony. Okay, and we were playing ball together in a place called Babe Ruth Stadium, which was right across the street from Yankee Stadium. And we were having fun hitting balls to each other. And then a black limousine pulls up and a man gets out. He's about six foot seven. And he comes over to us and he says, fellas, I'm the coach and trainer for Joe DiMaggio. I'm sure everybody listening knows who Joe DiMaggio, one of the greatest baseball players ever. And he was married to Marrow Monroe. So he was great everywhere. And uh, in, he said to us that Joe DiMaggio was, had heel surgery and he needed to recover. So he needed to get practice in Yankee Stadium. The Yankees were out of town for two weeks. And he asked us, he said, would you kids be interested in coming into Yankee Stadium and catching fly balls from Joe DiMaggio. And I, all of us looked like, we're not gonna say no. And he said, I'll give you $5 each to do it. $5 in 1947 was worth $25, $35, okay? So we all followed him into Yankee Stadium and uh, we, shook hands with DiMaggio, who was at home plate, and he said, thank you very much. And the catcher, the pitcher were there. And he says, go all the way out. And he says, I'm going to hit balls out to you. So for the next two hours, Joe DiMaggio hit fly balls to my fr five friends and myself. And we were looking at each other in the outfield. We're saying, is this really happening? Then after two hours, DiMaggio called us back in and he said, I want to thank you very much. And in order to commemorate the occasion, my trainer happens to have a little brownie camera. At that time, that's the camera that was around. No digital cameras in 1947. And he took a picture of Joe DiMaggio with my brother right next to him and all the five friends surrounding him. He took this picture and then he said to my brother and his friends, who knows, maybe we'll meet again. Well, one year later, 1948, my brother and his five friends, Georgie, Lenny, Bert, Franco, and Anthony, snuck into Madison Square Garden. At that time, there was always a hole in the gate, a hole in the door you could get in. You can't do that today, though. So they snuck in. And they went down to ringside. They hunkered down by ringside, waiting for the championship fight to begin. This was a championship fight. Rocky Graziano versus Tony Zale. Okay? And, and this was a return engagement. So they, they waited. And then my brother gets a tap on his shoulder. He turns around. And who's sitting behind him? Joe DiMaggio. You believe this? So DiMaggio was right one year later. And sitting next to DiMaggio is Ernest Hemingway, Humphrey Bogart, and Frank Sinatra. How is that for four powers, okay? 
and my brother and his five friends were their their mouths were hanging open, their eyes were wide, and basically that's what was happening. And then Dimaggio says, "Don't I know you kids? Don't I know you uh, from somewhere? Didn't you help me when I had heel surgery? Catch the ball for me?" And my brother said, "Yes, you have a great memory." So Dimaggio said, "Well." I won the most valuable player. I my batting average was 315. I stole 30 bases. I drove in 125 runs and I hit a home run in the playoffs and two home runs in the World Series and we beat the Brooklyn Dodgers. What more could you ask? <laughs> so at that point the security guards came and they wanted to kick us all out. But DiMaggio said, "No, no." These are my guests. And we stayed for the entire fight. Rocky Graziano won the fight in seven rounds with a technical knockout. It's called a TKO. And that was the end of that evening. And DiMaggio said to us, who knows? Maybe we'll see each other again. Well, 43 years later, in Rome, Italy, my brother finds out through the grapevine that there's going to be a banquet between the American and Italian embassy, and they're going to have a banquet in honor of guess who? Joe DiMaggio. So my brother calls up his good friend, Jeff, at the American embassy and says, Jeff, you gotta get me an invitation. So Jeff worked on it for an hour, got him an invitation. It was black tie only, formal. Next night he went wearing his tux, and there was Joe DiMaggio. 43 years later, my brother was older. Joe DiMaggio was older, much older. And he's sitting there. They're all drinking wine and eating good Italian food and giving a toast and giving a speech. And then finally, DiMaggio sits in his seat and is drinking his coffee. My brother gets enough nerve, goes up to DiMaggio and says, Mr. DiMaggio, I don't know if you recognize or remember me, but I was one of those kids who helped you when you had heel surgery by catching fly balls in Yankee Stadium. And DiMaggio looks at my brother and he says, remember you? Of course I remember you. Every morning when I go down to my breakfast area in Hollywood, Florida, where I live, there's a picture on the wall, eight by 11, of you, of me, you, and your five friends from that day in 1947. And my brother is speechless and he says, or he thinks this, he says, Joe DiMaggio has a picture of me on his wall. And that is the end of the story. Now, great story, right? But I didn't just tell you that. I want to see how much you remember from the story, okay? You can answer this by sending it in and writing it on a piece of paper, but I'll give the answer after I ask the question. So you, you try to do it. Okay, first question, what was my brother's name? That's the easy one. Okay, five seconds. Okay, see if you're right. His name is Harvey, okay. In what year did my brother and his five friends play ball together across the street from Yankee Stadium? I think some people got it right. 1947. Okay. 1947. And what was the name of my brother's five friends? They have five friends. My brother's Harvey. What are their names? Think. I said it twice during the story, okay? All right, let's see if you got it. It's Lenny, Georgie, Bert, Franco, and Anthony. So check off how many you got right. Names are the hardest, and we'll get into some names. Uh, okay. What was the name of the trainer 
for Joe DiMaggio, who came over to us and asked us to come into Yankee Stadium. Okay, write it down. Okay. If you got part of the name, that's good too. All right, his name was John McCormick. So see if you got that correct. You get one point for each question. All right. Went into Yankee Stadium. Oh, by the way, how much did he pay my brother and his five friends to do this? How much did he pay? Okay. If you said $5, you're right. Okay. They went across the street to Yankee Stadium. They went in there. They caught fly balls from Joe DiMaggio for how long? How long a period of time? Okay. If you said two hours, you're correct. At the end of that period in Yankee Stadium, DiMaggio suggested they do what to commemorate the day? Right. Take a picture. Okay? Picture's worth a thousand words. He took a picture, and when DiMaggio, and when everybody finished, DiMaggio said, Maybe we'll meet again. What year did my, my brother and his five friends meet Joe DiMaggio again? And where was it? Okay. Right. 1948. If you got that, you're correct. The location was Madison Square Garden. And it was a championship fight. Okay? Now, who was fighting? Who were the two boxes? And who won the fight? And what round was it in? Think of those that information. You got the, the names of the two fighters. What round did, did one of them win and who won? Okay? Thinking, thinking... All right, it was Rocky Graziano, Tony Zale. Graziano won in the seventh round by a technical knockout. So if you got that or you got part of it, give yourself a point for each. All right? Now, my brother was sitting there with his five friends, and he got a tap on the shoulder, and he turned around, and there was Joe DiMaggio sitting there. But along with Joe DiMaggio were three very famous people, okay? What are the names of those three people sitting next to DiMaggio? Think. Okay, the first one was Ernest Hemingway. The second one was Humphrey Bogart. The third one was Frank Sinatra. Okay? So, you get a point for that one. You get a point for each person you remember. All right. Now, DiMaggio said to my brother that, well, my brother said to DiMaggio that he has a very good memory, and DiMaggio gave him some statistics. Does anyone remember what batting average DiMaggio had for that year? Okay, if he didn't get it, the average was 315. And how many runs did he bat in? RBIs. 125 is the answer, if you got that right. And how many bases did he steal? 30 bases is the answer. Give yourself a point for that one. Okay, so, he, and he won an award. What is the name of that award? Right, most valuable player, MVP. And who did they beat in the World Series? What's the name of the team? The Brooklyn Dodgers. That's when the Dodgers were playing in New York and not in Los Angeles. Okay. All right, so basically you got all the information that Joe DiMaggio had mentioned to my brother. And they, they got up and they said goodbye. 
How many years later did my brother meet up with Joe DiMaggio? And where was it? 43 years later, 43 years later in Rome, Italy. And he went, he got an invite from his friend at the American embassy. What was his friend's name? His friend's name was Jeff. Okay, Jeff. So if you got that right, give yourself another point. When he went into the uh, banquet and he went up to DiMaggio and asked him if he remembered him, DiMaggio said, do I remember you? And what was his answer? You're right, that he had a picture of him, my brother's five friends, and my brother Harvey on the wall. And that's the story. Now, there's a, there was about 25 bits of information embedded in that story. So I would say that if you were listening carefully and you were focused and you were concentrating, you probably remembered something like 80 to 85 percent of that information. Some of you may have done even better than that. And if you only got 30 percent or 40, then you weren't listening that effectively you weren't concentrating your eyes and your mind may have separated and you needed to get them back together again okay now we have discussed the four target zones we've discussed the four powers of the mind and and they are observation concentration visualization association you use all those powers probably every day in your life either individually or all together one of those target zones that we talked about before where you can apply that is people information. People information, names and faces. Now, there are faces and there are names. Faces you see, you recognize. Names you recall because names are words, they're sounds. They're two different things. So you have recognition and you have recall. Now, recognition is the easiest thing for us to remember. That's why you do well in a multiple choice test, because you can recognize an answer to a question. But recalling something out of thin air from the back of your mind is much more difficult. So if you can convert recall into recognition, then everything becomes easier. Now, Let's look at this. Faces. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a series of faces and I'm going to give you their name. And I want you to do follow my suggestions. All right. So looking at this young lady, I would suggest choosing the features around her eyes and nose as one possibility. You may see something else, but that's the feature I see. Okay. She has a nice smile. And I'm focusing on that. Now, her name is Regina Salazar. And she is a travel agent. Okay, now, how do we remember that? Well, your anchor is the feature on the face. You chose, I, I chose the area just under the eyes and the nose. Her last name is what I work with first because last names are family names and they give you the history. So Salazar sounds like Sailing with a czar on his yacht. Sal is czar. Czar, Russian czar. Sal, a sail. And the czar has this big yacht and this, you're sailing on the yacht. And the first name of Regina means queen or royalty. So you're royalty, you're, you're queen or, or princess, and you're on the yacht with the czar sailing the Mediterranean, looking out on the beautiful blue waters and the bright sunshine, okay? And the occupation, she's a travel agent, it's a perfect fit. She, she reserved the boat to go on this trip with, with her. She's the travel agent that did it, okay? So now, here's a second one to try. The feature on his face that I would choose is his nose, a long nose, very easy to look at. His name is Anthony Pellegrino. 
Anthony Pellegrino. He's a Mercedes car dealer. Now, focusing on the last name. Well, Pellegrino is, is a bottled Italian water and it has a green bottle. That's one possibility. You notice what I'm doing. I'm converting the name that may be abstract into something that's concrete and visual as we did before with visualization. And another one that I would do with this is a green pelican, right? Pellegrino, Pellegrino. So I see in my mind's eye, I see on his nose, a green pelican sitting on his nose, waving his wings, waving his wings like an angel because his first name is Angelo. So you see what I did? I created a visual story out of his face, out of his name and his occupation. Occupation being, go back one, occupation being what uh, the uh, Mercedes car dealer. So maybe now they're gonna use a green pelican to put on the hood of a Mercedes. That would be an interesting thing. So now you have Anthony Pellegrino, Mercedes car dealer, all clustered in your mind. All right, let's go to the next one. All right. This is the feature on her face I would choose would be her high cheekbones and the nose area. She also has a very rosy complexion. Her name is Filene Metaxas. Filene Metaxas. Now we got, and she is a chief financial officer for a major corporation. We go to her last name. Now Metaxas is a Greek name. It's also the name of a brandy a Greek brandy. But I would look at the name and actually I see something in it immediately. Filing my taxes. It just, it's right there. Even though it's not spelled that way, the sound of it sounds like filing my taxes. And she's a chief financial officer, so it all fits together in a name and face occupation cluster. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, this is the, the feature on his face, which is hard to ignore, is the mustache and beard. Mustache and beard, uh, usually I don't choose it, but it's hard. I, I don't think he's going to shave it off too soon, and we could use it for now. His name is Howard Burnett, and he's an engineer, okay? Now, his last name is Burnett, so I see a fire something's burning and and it's his beard his beard and mustache are on fire and he's putting a net over it to put the fire out and he has a fire extinguisher because he's an engineer and he knows what to use and and his first name is howard and he would know how to do it so he put out the fire in his beard and he's okay now and that's how you would remember howard burnett engineer Okay, let's go. I think there's another one. All right. Look at the feature on her face. Probably the mouth area would be the one that you would look at. The mouth area, that would be the focal or anchor point. Her name is Olivia Campbell. Olivia Campbell, she's a marketing director. Last name is Campbell. Campbell Soup. She's eating Campbell Soup because the focus is on her mouth as a feature. And her first name is Olivia, olives, olives. She's eating a vegetable soup from Campbell's with olives in it. And she's the marketing director. So she's doing all the advertising for Campbell's vegetable soup. So now you have it all wrapped together in a visual story. And Olivia Campbell is now yours. Okay. I think this is the last face to look at. Look at the feature on his face. You notice his eyebrows go straight across. He has a high forehead and it goes down to the nose. His name is Joseph Brodsky. Joseph Brodsky, and he's a chef at a top French restaurant. Brodsky. Brodsky sounds like it's spelled with an S-K-I at the end. So it's skiing. There's skiing involved. I'm, I'm seeing in my mind's eye and it's broad, wide, wide skis like cross country skiing, or maybe wide skiing going down a hill. So you can go down from his forehead 
all the way to the tip of his nose on your skis. And his first name is Joe. So I think that he's dressed in a military uniform and he's G.I. Joe skiing down his nose, his forehead and his nose, and right into the restaurant where he's going to cook up a great dinner for all the guests. So there you have six faces and six names. See, let's see if you could remember each one if I just show you the face. Okay, write down his last name. Remember, look at the feature first, the beard. You chose the beard. Look at that. What was the story that you came up with or that I came up with for you? And the last name, the first name, and the occupation should all appear in your mind's eye. Okay? Secondly, look at the feature you chose right under the, the cheek area, right under the rosy complexion. Uh, her name has a direct meaning almost, even though it's not spelled that way. And she has a senior position in a corporation. So, okay. And the area we chose again was near the eyes. And she, her, go back, go back. Okay. No, no, back, back. Next one back. Okay. And, and you made a connection between her last name and her occupation and her first name. Write that down as you see it. Okay, go to the next one now. Oh, yeah, and, and her occupation. Uh, I see people getting this correct. Uh, now, you, you, this is a man who has a very interesting profession. He's best at his profession, and he's also doing something athletic. So what is his first and last name? And who do we have? Firstly, he's, and now we have somebody who's involved with food, Let's see if you can remember her name. First, last name, and occupation. Okay? And now, go to the next one. Okay? Remember, we chose, in this case, we chose his nose. What's sitting on his nose? What's waving its wings? What occupation is he in? Okay? Now, you just met six strangers. I don't know if you all got it correct. Names are very difficult unless you have a system, unless you have a technique. And this technique is the best there is. It's tried and true. It's been used for many, many years. In fact, the first book on memory was written in 82 BC. And they were doing this back then. And they're doing it today. And I've trained thousands of people to do this. It works, believe me. But you have to do the steps. You look at the face, you choose the anchor, you pay attention to it, you go to the last name, you convert the last name into a visual image, you convert the first name into a visual, you create a story, and you connect it to the occupation. Now, if you look at the summary of what we did, we paid attention by observing by concentrating, by visualizing, and by associating the four powers of the human mind that if you work on using a train, if you train your memory, and that's what we're trying to do here, and we'll do more at a later date, that you can train your memory to go to a level that you never thought was possible in your mind, the heights that you never thought you'd reach. You'll be able to do more work in less time. You'll be able to study and think and answer questions much more effectively because you will have information in long-term memory where you will have access. I remember a commercial with Bruce Lee, the famous Kung Fu uh, actor, and his face was close to the screen. And this little thing says it all. He looked in the screen and he says, so when you want it, it's there. And that's what memory is all about. Access. Have access to information that's in your long-term memory. And to get it to long-term memory, you have to go into short-term and change it from verbal to visual and bank that information 
in your brain's savings account. Thank you. No, don't go away, Frank. We have a I'm few not, questions. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> so our producer, please put up Frank so we can split the screen and, and ask him. Frank, this is this is marvelous. And and I know there are questions. Uh, by the way, I, I I don't know if I can see the whole uh, list of questions, uh, Marcelo, because there are very interesting. But let's start with this one. You mentioned uh, or you have given us a, a, a very powerful tool to remember associating all that. But what if it's a group of people, Frank? And perhaps it's important to remember each one of them or at least most of them. What do we do? Okay. Well, it's difficult to remember a group of people. So you have to decide. I'm going to remember at least one or two. So you focus on that because when you're introduced to a group, the host or the person who's doing the introductions usually goes pretty fast. Frank, I'd like you to meet so-and-so. I'd like you to meet this and that. So by the time, you know, three seconds pass and you've been introduced to four people, well, you, you focus on one or two and get that down pat. Or during the break, reintroduce yourself to those people and say to them, and this is a very elegant thing to do. It's very classy. You say, it's important to me to remember you. So let's reintroduce ourselves. I'm Frank Felberbaum. What is your name again? They give you your name and they're very happy to do that because they didn't remember your name either. So therefore, you cemented the relationship. And if you want, if you need time when you're meeting people to apply this system, just ask questions like, by the way, what school did you go to? What business are you in? What do you do? In fact, most people say to most people, what do you do before they even ask their name? Uh, and you ask, uh, what, what's your hobby? Do you know a good restaurant around here? You know, you throw out questions. So what happens? They're talking and you're visualizing and associating and putting the name and face together. It gives you time to do it. So that's a strategy. And the other is a technique. Okay. So Love that's it. the way I would work a small group. We have questions. Uh, for example, Chantal Perez, she has a question that I'm going to combine it with another one that I saw. Mindfulness, let's say meditation and all that. Let's mix it up with a mandala and everything that we can apply. Do you believe it enhances brain power? Well, the mandala and my, man, mindfulness is a, is a form of working with a mandala because you're focusing right. on the present you're in the present like existentialism you're in the present now and you're focusing on that nucleus in the middle of the mandala what that does is improve your concentration which in turn improves your brain power and your memory because the concentration is the first threshold to your memory so as a result of doing that step by step your entire brain power improves. You have to do it on a regular basis. And and uh, the mandala is very powerful. It's such a simple thing to do. Two minutes a day, twice a day. Unbelievable. Seven <laughs> weeks, do it. <laughs> there was a you know? question in regards of when you go to uh, job interviews, how do you try to multitask or, or find focus? Let's say the mandala could help. But you're you're the pro. Well, you mean you're you're being interviewed for a job. That's is yeah. that the situation? Okay. Yeah. Well, you want to first of all, you do research before you go. You do research about the company. You find out all about the company that you're being interviewed for. Maybe you can find out who's going to interview you. Uh, you think of all the possible questions that they're going to ask you, and you think about them in your mind and think of all the possible answers. So by the time you're sitting in front of the interviewer, this is not a strange thing anymore. It's familiar. It's part of you. You, It's going to flow. It's going to flow like wine because basically you're ready for it. You're prepared. And and the answers will be there. And, and when you're prepared, just like a Broadway show, when somebody does the same thing every night, saying the same words, the same lines, They are prepared, but what they're doing is they're looking at the audience and they're acting differently each night 
they're doing different body language. And by being prepared, you can handle any objection that might come up by the person interviewing you. So preparation is the key thing. The same thing with going to a meeting. If you can get a list of all the people that will be attending the meeting you're going to, you can look at that list beforehand and change the names into visual stories. All right, and all you have to do is connect those visual stories of all the names on the list to the faces of those people that you'll meet at the meeting. You have did like 60% of the work ahead of time. And you'll find Frank, that, that, that that's how memory experts do it. <laughs> and I guess there are more questions, but I guess we're running out of time. You owe us one answer. Is it possible to memorize a book? But I guess, please uh, put something on Facebook or, or, or send us an email because we need to know about that. Uh, a book or the dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> you can Frank, memorize you anything, anything, but you why can would you anything. do that? <laughs> that's I the agree. point. You, you can want carry to the book, and that's it. <laughs> well, you can, you can do the Bible. That's a good thing to memorize. <laughs> that is true, right? I, we have to memorize question. this workshop so we can uh, was empower our and enhance our brain power. Thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge with all of us. My, my pleasure, Raphael, and. And goodbye to all the hundred, is it a hundred or more students in all the colleges around the country? Princeton, uh, Harvard, CCNY, <laughs> you're everywhere. This yes, is sir. the most important skill you'll ever develop. Use it. Thank you. And it's the best superpower we have. Thank you so much, Frank. And we have to uh, move forward because we have a, such a special a uh, person that I'm going to introduce. She's great. You guys love her. Uh, she is a businesswoman and a community leader who immigrated to the United States from her birthplace, Puerto Plata, La Reina del Atlantico in the Dominican Republic. She is the first woman uh, as a shareholder elected president of Alta and many, many, many other accomplishments. She was the president of the board of directors of the Dominican Day Parade, the National Dominican uh, Day Parade. And of course, with us, Maria Curi. This is a great <laughs> night. We're memorizing everything, but I can't say it all because I know time is precious right now. Listen, Rafael, after that great presentation from Frank, I just wonder what does he see when he sees my name in my face, right? That's what we all <laughs> wonder. So, right? that, so we'll get him on the next one. I mean, there was so much more to cover. You know that this is part one and we will have part two. And I see all the interactions of all our students. They're fantastic. They're making chats. We know that we are in several different areas in Facebook. We're live streaming. We're also on our um, web uh, site. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Rafael, for your generous time and always being here for the National Dominican Day Parade. Uh, Ivani's had a little bit of problems uh, with his Wi-Fi. He was on the go. But listen, it is the way things are today, and we all try to do what we can with the technology that we have. Indeed. You have a lot of shadows, Maria, but the stage is yours. Well, no, listen, we're here specifically because we want to make sure that our uh, scholarship recipients are very engaged. Uh, we think that there will be a series of about six different workshops, including uh, business etiquette. We're also going to have, you know, how to really do that, that big interview that you're preparing for, how to be an entrepreneur. There's several different questions that we ask everyone. We're trying to be very engaged. The mission of the National Dominican Day Parade, of course, is to make sure that we are very uh, highlighting our community, highlighting the things that we do. But most important for us is to make sure that we mentor our scholars recipient that we work hand in hand with them I can tell you that 99.5 percent of our scholarship recipients have donated to the scholarship fund that says a lot they receive they're also taught to give they're very engaged with us trying to make sure that they're available uh, present uh, we're trying to figure out exactly where we can have them volunteer so we know that we have several of our partners and sponsors, and look, I, I would be amiss if I didn't mention, you know, people like the Yankees, uh, uh, Liberty Coke, uh, of course, Somos, and Goya, 
who are actually there with us all the time and making sure that these students continue to have the things that we believe are important for them. But we know that some of you may be asking how you can get involved. You definitely can. We have an area there at natddp.org where you can go in, find out, volunteer, ask the questions. Uh, you know that we're still celebrating. We had our virtual parade. And we're gonna continue to celebrate our heritage, how proud we are. You are, Rafael, being a proud Dominican. I am as well, and all of our scholarship recipients as Dominican. Scholarship will open. It's going to open in January. We encourage our students. I am a speaker at the University of Connecticut, invited by one of our uh, scholarship recipients. I'll be there on uh, uh, November the 19th. And so one of the things I do want to do is continue to open the doors for other scholarship recipients. And of course, that uh, I would say I'm not, not only proud, Maria, of of being a part of this, but also to see the work you, all the, the whole team is putting together uh, to make this happen. Uh, and tens of thousands of dollars are right now, uh, let's say with the beneficiaries of the scholarships and you guys are changing the world because when you change individuals, when you change our Yeah, your Wi-Fi you is a little more. off, Rafael. <laughs> but, but look, the, and that it, it, listen, it starts with what you can give more than what you can receive. And we try to teach that to our uh, parade and scholarship recipients. We do want to thank also our council member, Idanis Rodriguez. I am in the business of travel. I can only tell you it's very vivid in my mind, uh, you know, what happened in November 12 of 2001. Uh, right off what we happen to have gone through on September, but this was specific to our community and how we uh, came together and made sure that we continue to remember uh, the incident that occurred. But again, uh, most important here are our scholarship recipients. They know it. Uh, we make sure that our sponsors know it. Uh, we make sure that everyone that joins our hands, if, if there's opportunity for mentorship and internships, uh, we want to make sure that you reach out to us. Uh, some of our sponsors were writing to me. I know our our great partner now, Bolle Bank, was writing and texting me, telling me how exciting this workshop is. So it's not only for our scholarship recipients, it's for everyone. We know we were multitasking, right, Rafael? Trying to also <laughs> get into the memory. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, we were able to uh, be sort of wondering where, where we're going to go from next. But look, kudos to our chair, uh, Wilton Cedeño. Uh, he uh, brought this wonderful speaker to us, Frank. Uh, he went through a whole training with him and 40 minutes, an hour is not enough. But we're gonna give our students more. We're planning to probably even do some little sessions just with them. Frank has committed himself uh, to really do whatever he can with us. And he is very vetted by many major corporations. So we're very lucky that he sort of tailored this for us. Our media partners, you know, we had the likes of uh, WABC uh, really do a PSA for us. So did Telemundo, we had uh, PIX, we had New York One. We also had Univision along with their radio programs. So, you know, this the work gets out and it's out there. And what we try to do is we like to make this affordable to our community. So if you were able to join us, you could have joined us for nothing. But believe you me when I tell you that we have had donations, $1 to thousands of dollars, just a regular donation for us to be able to grow our scholarship fund, which is what we do. We collect our money to make sure that we continue to give scholarships. And we're grateful. We're grateful for every dollar we receive. Like I said, the scholarship recipients, we've had them give $100. The minimum, the minimum donation that we receive from our scholarship recipients is $50. So that tells you where their heart is. That tells you that they understand that they need to make sure they pay it forward. And that's what they're doing as well. Look, I think we had a great evening. Uh, again, much appreciation goes to the different companies that we partner with the different sponsors along the year. We're planning 2021, the second Sunday of the month of August is our parade. We're hoping that 2021 will be blessed for us with, with, with a wonderful parade on the street. Rafael, you've been our wonderful host. You know how celebratory it is. 
Um, and so we're, 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 we're really sh shooting for it to be there. But if not, we'll be on virtually. We put on a great parade virtually. We were excited. You can go online and look at it. And so the best thing for us is to stay safe. Make sure you wear those masks. Wash our hands. And by the way, I am in my hometown, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, speaking to so? all of you with this. This is where I am. You see the <laughs> tropical painting and the background. You can't see the beautiful view that I have because it's sort of dark outside. But I have a great view and I and I am excited to join you guys there and uh and be with you hold on i think i unplugged myself wait a minute this is this is a live so i want to make sure we get everything in there so listen uh it, it's phenomenal Thank you, maria for making us jealous everybody's jealous right now <laughs> so i had to you know i had to let you guys know that i'm here in our country and uh just excited about our democracy and the transfer of power that occurred here so we, we had an election in August here in the country and it was great. So we learned from experience how to really do it right. And um, hopefully we'll continue in our country to make sure in the United States we do it correctly. Well, <laughs> and the graciously. Pope said something today. So I think we're getting <laughs> we're into on, that point too. We're praying and on, and on the bandwagon. Thank you everyone. I love the remarks uh, from, from all of our scholarship recipients and I love the remarks from our partners. Uh, and thank you again, Frank. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you to our producer um, and so many people behind the scene. And, and I see one of our scholarship applicants uh, who was a finalist and didn't really get a scholarship but many of those participate with us and they're very proud and they're thankful and they're making wonderful remarks to us, thanking the parade for still including them and inviting them to participate with us. So again, we'll continue to do this. We hope you'll join us again. Make sure you visit our website and uh, tomorrow is another day, but we'll be safe and we'll make sure to, uh, to do well. Thank you again. Good evening. Good evening.